Daikaraya. Good evening. <laughs> Welcome to Council Fire with the River Winds. We are Imperfect Hosts. I'm Chief Joseph. And Dr. Laurelyn Riverwind. And we have a special guest with us tonight. Not to mention all of the lovely guests outside. You will hear birds and wind chimes and all kind of things. And an occasional helicopter or jet. Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> well, Heavenly Father, we just bless you. We thank you for this time. And it's beautiful weather out here. And we thank you for the blessings of everything that you've provided this whole past week. And we just ask that you bless our listeners and bless this time together as we talk about some really wonderful and incredible subjects about Southeastern history and you, our Abba Father. And we just bless you in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, yes, yes. a man and a man. And we are coming at you today for one of the last times <laughs> mm -hmm, from Murphy, North Carolina, in the Appalachian Mountains. So this is why we are doing this outside. We love our mountains, <laughs> but we are being relocated. One of the things that we were told today was, what do you mean you haven't done a show on Blessed Blend? And so we said, you know what? That's a, actually a wonderful idea. So for those of you who don't know what a Blessed Blend is, that was the name that we created, told us to give our band. Originally. Originally. And the, the term came about, will you tell the story, hon? Well, there was, uh, we were at a Highland game because, you know, I have some Scottish blood through my mother's side. And Irish. And Irish. So Celtic is, is very much part of who I am. And Celtic people love Native people. We were basically given a mandate to combine these two music styles in one sound. And when we were at a Highland game one time, there was a very elderly gentleman who was talking to us, and he heard that we were combining Celtic music sound with native traditional sounds. He was a McDonald, wasn't he? I want to say he was, but mm -hmm. I might not want to depend too heavily on my memory with that, but he was probably close to 90 years mm -hmm. old. And dancing. Mm -hmm. Boy, could he dance. And those pipes and those drums were going. But when he heard us, I had the hand drum and you were doing some Celtic style harmonies behind it. And then he looks at us and he says, well, I. Yeah, he, he said. Y'all oh, be blessed blends, eh? You're blessed blends. And we said, what is a blessed blend? We'd never heard that term before. And this this man, this, well, he, he was at least an octogenarian, maybe even more than that, he told us that back in the old days, in the colonial days, people from the Celtic culture would come across the Great Pond. Well, they were the first immigrants into these Appalachian Mountains. And that they would settle here and found such a commonality with Native people. The wearing of eagle feathers, the chiefdoms, the love of the, the land, clan the clan systems, systems. Mm -hmm. and the tribal nature, and their the commonalities with the oppression oppression they experienced from the English. Oh yeah, yeah, because the the Irish had their trail of tears long before the Cherokee ever did. Or yes, the Creek, a lot my of the Irish here. people come from those who were removed onto the portion of Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, that then became like the reservation lands. Mm -hmm. And so many people don't realize that that is a, something that occurred in Ireland as well. Native America is not the first one to experience that. But he told us that the union of a Native person and a Celtic person, and also the children produced by that union, were termed blessed blends. And we'd never heard that before. And what a beautiful term. Rather than mixed blood or half-breed or mutt, there's such a beauty in that description of those two worlds coming together. So as we were making these CDs and making these albums, blending the Celtic and Native sound together, and we did a lot of touring, the Highland Game Circuit, uh, doing concerts and everything and outreaches, we came across somebody named Daphne Swilling. I think we actually came across her at a at a spiritual event. It was at a spiritual and event. And I would like to introduce Daphne now. She is one of my dearest friends ever to exist on the face of this wonderful, beautiful planet. Daphne, will you and all of your boisterousness <laughs> say hello? And who are we saying hello to? All those people out in virtual 
radio internet land. Yes. Who are and also virtually kind of here with us at the council fire. The council fire. And how far out does this go, it, your radius? Well, we've Internationally. Act, yes, we, we've, we've got listeners in Israel, Pakistan, Russia, Africa, uh, the UK, Canada, all over the place. That was a couple months ago. We're like, wow, this is so neat. So go ahead and say hello in all of those languages. <laughs> I don't know all the languages other than hello, and then I am a hillbilly. <laughs> Hi, y'all. <laughs> Hi, y'all. How you doing? <laughs> well, one of the things that fascinated us when we first met Daphne and we were talking about because she has a, a heart for reconciliation and also seeing the, the key of the Celtic people and First Nations people as being crucial to revival. Uh, especially in the southeast and here in the south southeastern gate. I would love for Daphne to tell because she had been plowing this field of joint awareness concerning relationship between the Celtic people and the native people for many years before the Lord drew us onto that field. And so us newbies back a decade or so, decade and a half ago, we were kind of new on the scene but she had been, this had been on our radar, her radar mm -hmm. for many years. I would love for you to tell from your perspective what, what you have been through, your ministry, and what the Lord is doing. And then tie into that the whole Peregrini understanding and how that relates. Well, many years ago, I began to work on you are right, reconciliation. Many of you who you have maybe study history about Northern Ireland, some of you may not, but it is the whole conflict between the IRA and the, which is the, the Catholic Republic faction, Army. that's right, and then the Protestant faction, and they were, um, they called it 30 years of the Troubles. And so, I was there as a bridge builder. I was sent there. It was a ministry to build a bridge. When was that? It was in probably starting in 1998, something like that, to build a bridge between those two conflicting factions of bringing the leaders together. And so to discuss the conflict, why there's a conflict. And was that basically the Catholics and the Protestants? Yes, it was It was like um, it wasn't the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. It right. was a political, it was a political group named the Catholics and a political group named, named the Protestants. Yes, and so that's a little separate than official church business. You know, yes, that's right. It, that's exactly right because um, the remorse of this is that the world always called Northern Ireland is the land where Christians killed one another. That is not true. Mm. Mm. Uh, Jesus Christ had nothing to do with this conflict. And so, based on that, I was equipped. I worked with reconciliation. And so, just to let you know, uh, you know about the Native American element, it actually started in Northern Ireland while I was working with building a bridge with this conflict. I... It started in Ireland with Native Americans, and I'll explain that. That's exciting. Mm. I explained that. One day I was walking down the main street of Belfast, and because I connected with the government, because I was working as an outside person, which was a benefit because I was not a part of the system, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and with the government people, to build a bridge for peace between these two people groups. And um, so I, I had had a meeting there at the seat of government. I was walking out. I was walking down the road to get my bus to take me home. And I saw, to my unbelief, a Cherokee Indian walking down Main Street. What? <laughs> in Belfast, Ireland. In Belfast, Ireland. In and how, all, how did you know? How did, How did you know he was know Cherokee? He was Indian. Because I am from Chattanooga, Tennessee. 
which is one of the homes of the of the Cherokee. Well, that practically makes you an expert. <laughs> <laughs> Is he wearing feathers? Did he have high cheekbones? Well, <laughs> you know, one thing about the Cherokee, they are not like the Plains Indians. Mm-hmm. That is true. Which, which you know, the, the, the uh, eagle feathers and the color. Cherokees seem to be a little bit subtle with their regalia. And I knew that. He was walking down that street, and the way that he had that feather in his hair, and also the the um, what he had on his shirt, mm-hmm. you know, the Cherokee shirt, the ribbon, the ribbon, ribbon shirt, shirt. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought that is a Cherokee Indian, <laughs> and I, in all my shyness, ran up to him and said, now, "Now, keep in mind, folks, for those of you who can't see Daphne, she's blonde as all get out, blue eyed." Very fair skinned and, in Belfast, Ireland, running up to the Cherokee Indian. Okay, and, now. And when she <laughs> says, in all of her shyness, there could not be more tongues and more cheeks <laughs> than her saying shyness. I mean, she probably should say shyness all drawn out like a southerner because it is just not true. And so it's what not happened? True. I ran up to him <laughs> and said, What are you doing here? <laughs> I'm sure you said it just like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, he saw, he heard my southern accent, and he said, well, what are you doing here? <laughs> I said, point taken. <laughs> what but are you doing here? But I knew that what he said to me was very important. Why are you here? I mean, you know, after all, he did stick out. Mm-hmm. And you didn't. And I did not. He said to me, in all sincerity, I don't really know, but all I, but this I can say, I'm on a journey of discovery. I feel like I need to connect with the Celtic people. And the fact that he even knew to say Celtic in the land of Ireland, because mm. a lot of people don't understand that Ireland is part of the Celtic general group, yes. that there is. You know, we know that Celtic peoples are Scottish, they're Irish, there's Welsh. E- and Welsh, Isle of Man, Isle of Man, and also in Spain, mm-hmm. Galicia, the, the Gaelic, mm-hmm. yeah, or the Galician, yeah, or Isle Galician. of Wight, North Spain, absolutely, all of those groups. Most people don't know that there are seven Celtic nations, mm-hmm. in fact, that make up the Celtic group. That's exactly right. And and again, this is information. All of you out there, take your notes. You won't get this anywhere anywhere else in the whole United States of America. And so what happened from that moment that that just spurred you, that gave you that, that revelation, that confirmation of what well, you were doing there? It was it was a an ongoing process it, to where he said I needed to connect I need to connect with the Celtic people and I said and and for some reason I did not pursue that to say what are you why are you connecting with the the Celtic people? Yeah. He seemed to be in a hurry, and so we moved on our separate ways. I wish I'd have gotten his name and telephone number. But the next day, wouldn't it be wonderful if he heard this one day and said, "Oh my goodness, that's mm-hmm. me she's talking about. Mm-hmm. I remember that blonde-haired, blue-eyed woman." That's. Well, Daphne Swilling is her name. Daphne <laughs> Swilling. And con- connect with us. We will connect her with you. From Chattanooga, Tennessee. Mm-hmm. The next day, I was speaking in an Irish church in the middle of Ireland. I walked into the church. And as I walked into the church, I looked on the wall of this church. And there was a huge map of the United States of America, which I thought was very unusual. I thought, what is this? I walked forward, I looked at that map, and I said to the pastor who was coming up behind me to welcome me to the church, what is this? He said, oh, Daphne, that is our prayer map. Nice. We as a congregation feel like that that the Lord is calling us. Now, understand this, that I did not say about this Cherokee Indian. I knew... I knew that that Cherokee was a traditionalist. Mm. Mm. He was traditionalist. Not necessarily, he was not, I would not say a, a, a Christian. So you as Indians, describe what a traditionalist is. 
they're the ones that um, that they they hold to the old ways. So among the Cherokee, that would be the Kitua. Uh They're the the most traditional of, of all the Cherokee people. Uh, do, you know the old songs, the old ceremonies. Uh, live by by the old traditional ways of the Cherokee before uh, any European influence. And oftentimes there are some unresolved pains and difficulties that mm -hmm. are still present concerning colonialism and settlement and loss of land. I mean, it's it's difficult to not find those issues even amongst mm -hmm. believers who are of native descent. That That's a very complicated and difficult process to go through. And we have met traditionalists who are very uh, outwardly traditional, but inwardly they're believers because being traditionalists, there's people have stories and prophecies that talk about creator's son. So there has to be a reconciling there that takes place. Uh, but, but most if they choose to listen to those. Yeah. Well, here's what happened the next day after I met that traditionalist was as I was looking at that map, the pastor said, we feel as, a, as an Irish congregation that we need to, listen to this, connect <laughs> with the Native Americans in the United States of America. And we have put this map up and we have put... Uh, we have labeled where all the tribes are. We have we have all done this uh, research where the tribes are in this nation. We've put the and we have located all as far as we know all the tribes in the United States of America where they live. I just have to say how exciting it is to hear that there could be a people group out there who care enough for our people to research, to map, and to be mm -hmm. praying for, and, and that we would even be on their radar. And, you know, we feel very lost and forgotten and, and discarded, disregarded among our own nation, you know, amongst Americans. Um, we feel kind of pushed to the side. And the fact that we would be a focus of a church anywhere in the world mm -hmm. feels really endearing and and really special and we are so grateful for people out there who are praying for the first nations people and our ministry is not just a first nations people we are a ministry for, for to all, the, all the nations mm -hmm. but of course our own native people hold a special place and so we yeah. really want to thank those out there who are who we are on their prayer radar. Absolutely. And so, so what ended up happening? Well, what happened was he, he really wanted to express the fact we are called to pray for Native Americans. And, and they said one day we desire to visit America and connect with the tribes because we, we've, it's, it is a call to connect with them. We, we do not know exactly why we're connecting. <laughs> Just as that traditionalist, that Cherokee said, I don't know exactly what's going on here, but you've got a traditionalist and you've got a Christian congregation mm -hmm. that is saying the same thing. And I'm thinking, what is this well it, it doesn't surprise me so much with the Cherokee traditionalists because the traditional name for God for the Cherokee is Yohewa you know so you know and creator is spirit and when they're praying to the great spirit and any who calls to to God he's going to answer you know there's and, only one creator mm -hmm. only one who created every single thing that exists so I'm not There's surprised no that he was. Yeah, I'm not surprised that he was guided as, as the same way that you were being guided. And so, when somebody prays to Creator, those that's a very specifically directed prayer. They're not just saying God, who anybody could. Yeah, I mean, how many yeah, gods are there? There's thousands and thousands and thousands. But of Creator, them. nobody can steal those prayers up. Mm. Those prayers are very directed to the one who created everything and everyone. And so, when we guide prayers to Creator. They're going to God the Father, Yahweh, Abba, Daddy, the Heavenly Father. 
And so why would he not begin directing those people who are sending prayers to him all toward a common goal, a same Mm -hmm. thing, something he wants to draw people into? And I'd like to draw in what you're saying with, do you remember a man we introduced you to at the Highland Games where we were talking about earlier? His name was David Ross, a, a wonderful friend one of the historians who wrote a book that ended up being one of the main books that was pulled historically into the movie Braveheart mm, well, by he, Mel he Gibson. was the historian for that movie and one of the he, top is, ones. he was a very well-renowned historian before his passing but you used to love taking pictures with him because you came up to like his waist. His claymore, but his claymore was like an eight foot tall sword as it was. He was you know, huge. I'm no tiny girl. I've got some Amazon girth type of thing. <laughs> and she really does. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt like I was just petite next to him. He was a big old man, tall, huge claymore that he mm-hmm. would take his pictures with. That's, actually, that's actually who the song is about on our Tribal Thunder album. Yes, we it did is. a memorial song for him. Yes, it is. Um, but when, yeah, when he died, the the father gave me a song for him, and um, it, it was you, named Warrior Bard. Yeah, because you were you were we were asked to do a memorial song for him. Mm. So, but he had a book out, and I wish. We'll find the name of the book and we'll put it on our blog about this. But that book, when he heard us talk about this very subject. I remember this, yeah. He was so excited. He He went and grabbed his book Mm -hmm. and he said, this is on page such and such. He's like, look right here. And he flipped it open and right on that page, he was writing about the traditional Scottish stories about that there was a connection between the Celts and the natives, just like you talk to a lot of the elder Cherokee and, and the, uh, the elders from the East Coast, and they'll tell you there's always been a connection these, with these mountains to the, the Celtic people. And that mountain mm-hmm. was a range that pulled from Scotland across the Atlantic Ocean and back up into it. The Appalachians. Right, right. You it, go, it, girl. it connects. Tell us about it. Have what have you heard? Amazing story, and a lot of people, those of you out there, pull up your chair just a little bit. (laughs) You need to hear this story. Not a lot of people know this. I'm sitting on the porch with a Cherokee elder. She was a friend of mine. She, I was honored that she accompanied me to Ireland, and I was visiting her in Cherokee, North Carolina. And she said to me as we're sitting in our rocking chairs, Now, Daphne, I know you go to Ireland. She says, I, this was before she had gone to Ireland. She says, I really would like to go to Ireland. But she says, Now, did you know our Appalachians, they, you know, they, they run up the East Coast and, you know, you know, they go all the way up to Maine. Did you know that? And I said, Yes, I Yes, I I did know that the Appalachians went all all the way up to Maine. Well, that there may be something you didn't know, <laughs> and I'm going to tell you. Those Appalachian mountains, they just keep going all the way under the water. Under the water, and guess where they come out at? Where? I said, <laughs> "Well, are you going to say Ireland?" Yes. <laughs> We have known as Cherokee people, those mountains, those mountains are connected with our our mountains. Wow. And who was it it that you were meeting with? Her name was Walker. Her name was, her last name was Walker. Which is definitely a Cherokee traditional name. Which was Walker is a Scottish name. Mm. And I said, Whoa! The Appalachian Mountains what? <laughs> end up in Ireland? Yes. And so those of you who have um, anointings about prayer walks and mapping, um, prophetic mapping and prayer, may understand this a little bit better than those of us who are just now getting into that understanding. 
That's like because it's it's about land and you know boundaries. Boundaries mm-hmm. and land and and she says so so it it is like when they began to come over here it was like they almost were coming home. Mm-hmm. Wow. And speaking of that this is something that's coming around full circle because here you are in Belfast, Ireland, and you're thinking that this that the that the Holy Spirit is is wanting to connect the First Nations people and the Celts, both people that understand sacred fire. They both understand the fire of the Holy Spirit, right? But this is nothing new. This actually goes back further than what our history books teach us. Wow. And that was something that you had told us about, the Peregrini monks. Tell us about that and that connection. Well, the Peregrini, first of all, this word Peregrini, it's it's an ancient Gaelic word. Gaelic, you can use it Irish or Gaelic. Um, It means wandering missionary. And in Ireland, there is a, well, there was a bestseller book that was out many years ago called How the Irish Saved Western Civilization. It was a bestseller. We have that book, Mm -hmm. and I think you are the one who gave it to us. (laughs) They were a sent-out people, and they, uh, they were wandering missionaries. They were sent out from Ireland, from um, places like Bangor, Mm. places like the Isle of Iona in Scotland, and and they were sent. They were sent out, and the legend says that they were sent out to to preach the gospel. And they they sat in boats, getting ready to to be launched out in the water. I love this toward love Europe, this. Mm. and it says that that it was an they were oarless boats. And when you say oarless, you mean without oars for rowing. Without oars for rowing. And didn't they even do a funeral for them? Because they knew they didn't know if they would ever come home again? Several times they did funerals. Because later on in the in the 1700s, when they would leave uh, Ireland to come to the United States for a better life, it was, an, it was a funeral. Because they knew they'd never see they would their never see again. But but it was a different perspective with these peregrine monks because it was a type of martyrdom. Mm. It was called the green martyrdom, wow. in which they gave their lives for the sake of the gospel, and that they they were going to be sitting down in a boat, and they would ask the Holy Spirit to blow in their sails, and the Holy and it was said. That the wind would begin to blow through the sails. No, in other words, no, no flesh was involved with this with oars. Hmm. In other words, the direction and the guidance and the and the place that they would land would be completely up to the ruach, the wind, the, wind, <laughs> the spirit. And so they were not helping, quote unquote, by getting there by man's power and strength and. Oars. It was being guided absolutely by the Creator. Blown by the wind. Mm -hmm. Blown by the wind. And they knew that when that boat arrived on that shore, wherever it may be, they had enough provisions that they felt that would get them to the shore. Hmm. Enough food, enough water. And they were depending on the Holy Spirit to to show them how how much provisions to bring. And how did that work out? They had just enough to arrive on the shores after the last morsel and the last sip of water was drunk. Absolutely. Every bit of faith they had was used. They began to move through the countries of Europe. And it is said they would stand on the sides of the road they were to preach the gospel. And they said that, th- that they would ask the people who would walk on those dirty roads, may I wash your feet. Wow. They wanted to wash their feet. And when they began, they knelt down 
with, with a pan of water to wash their feet. And people were so touched. They'd say, why are you doing this? They said, because we represent one who, wants, who has a message for you to change your life. Hmm. And that was the Lord Jesus, Yeshua, HaMashiach. Hmm. And so how... How in the world do these peregrini monks who sacrificed so much, gave so much of their lives, how are they connected with the First Nations? You know, tribes and clans all have a lot in common. Mm -hmm. They the they have a, a political system, first of all, mm -hmm. that is the same. A protocol. They have a protocol. They have a chief. They have the clans, and they all depend upon one another, and they have a lot in common. Mm -hmm. And so, when they begin to move, when they begin to move out in these boats, now understand this. Understand this. We know that the Peregrini went to Europe, but mm -hmm. also, listen to this. <laughs> they got in their boats, and they were launched. To the west, and that is to go to this the land that would eventually be called America. Now we haven't we haven't mentioned this on, on purpose yet, but tell them about what century these Peregrini monks were going out. Seven hundred, about seven hundred A.D. Let's just let that sink in for a second here. What? Eighth century. There are monks who made it here to the Americas. Sound unreal? Oh, it's true. It's very true. Share about what happened. Uh, let's when just you... make sure everybody is catching the fact that Columbus mm -mm. was not anybody who discovered anything. Well, he did discover something, but it doesn't mean anything was missing. Mm -hmm. We discovered just, him wandering lost in the exactly. ocean. Exactly. And here he is getting credit in 1492 when there were Irish monks here. A millennia before a millennium before him. You're probably thinking, what in the world? We'll let Daphne tell this story. Well, <laughs> It came to my attention uh, through some friends. You've got to read these articles of an archaeologist who was vetted by the Smithsonian of some caves in a little state called West Virginia. <laughs> West Virginia was West la Virginia. landlocked hmm. with mountains. But in that state, there, it, there are caves... In which there there are writings on the caves called Irish or or Celtic Ogham or Ogham. Ogham. Ogham yes. And now now people thought that these were Indian petroglyphs first at first, right? That's when exactly they were right. When they were discovered. Yeah. That's exactly right. But it was not. Uh, in fact, it was not. Uh, the uh, the writings of Native Americans, it they could find nothing in America that could um, uh, line, con up, yeah. line up with those with those markings on those caves. So what they did, this particular archaeologist got in touch with the with Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland, and asked if archaeologists that were um their their uh their whole teaching what how they taught their the whole subject matter of Olgham mm -hmm. uh would they come over to to check out these writings to verify it to, to, to absolutely to verify is this Celtic Olgham or what is this well they were intrigued in Ireland of course they're going to come over and check it out and in fact, that it checked out that yes, it was. Was that not your good friend? No, it was not a good friend. This is not the particular archaeologist that I was thinking of. Right, that you're thinking of. But it was it was a it was a man who had been working on. He was studying the Native American history in West Virginia. Mm 
Hmm. And really, when you think about West Virginia, you really don't relate a lot of Native American activity in you West think Virginia. Of coal mines. Coal we mines. Come from the West Virginia That's right. coal mines. That's right. You know, but, you little Hank Williams in there. but to sit down with him, he said, there are hundreds and hundreds of acres of burial grounds of Native Americans who are buried in in that land of West Virginia. Now, they found remains in this cave, didn't they? They found a skull in these caves. And this is what this, is what this amazing thing about it was. Smithsonian, the Smithsonian Institute, got wind of this skull they had found. And they were sent down from Washington, D.C., down to West Virginia to take this skull... And to, what is that process? The DNA analysis uh, of determining how how old. Oh, carbon an object, dating. Yes, it's exactly what they did, and discovered that the, that the the uh, skeleton and the skull was about seven hundred from it was as old as seven hundred from seven hundred eighty. Wow! And that that was so, the Smithsonian. That's the Smithsonian. So, so, so the timeline matches. Yes. Did they do so DNA did they tests? do DNA analysis? Yes, they did. And what did they find? It was this particular person was from Ireland. Ooh, 8th century genetics bring up Ireland. Folks, Carbon dating, 8th century. Burn your history books because they're full of lies. This is remaking history. And, mm -hmm. you know, people think that this stuff happened a few hundred years ago, that there were visitors from other continents just in the 1400s. That's not the case. Oh, there was Phoenicians that came here. There were so many exactly. other civilizations. And now what ended up happening, this is, now you, as, as, as absolutely incredible as this story is, it gets even better. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, but listen. Here's here's the deal: the writings on the caves, on the wall, the writings the on, writing the on the wall, <laughs> the writing on the wall. Um, according to the experts from Trinity College, Dublin, Ireland, said that those writings were passages from the book of John. Wow. In the language of the Old Gong. Yes. In the Old Gong So language. what is happening is this. The relationship that started so very, very long ago of the Peregrini, the wandering missionaries who sent many expeditions, many missionary uh voyages to preach the gospel to the indigenous people of America. Many of many came mm -hmm. because they there were multitudes of the Native Americans. And so they came and they preached and they wrote the gospel on those caves. What was done with the bones? What was done with the the remains? When the Smithsonian took the bones um, out of um, permission from the archaeologist and the powers that be. They knew that they were, they, they promised they would return the bones. To their rightful to place? To the rightful what? place, the original burial place. Okay. But this archaeologist with a sensitivity toward this burial said, you know what? We're just not going to put it in the ground. We need to have a, a ceremony of a burial blessing again. Mm -hmm. Now, it's an amazing thing that not very far from that place was a monastery. In West Virginia. In West Virginia. A monastery. A monastery of monks that were set aside to pray and to, and to, to read, to meditate. And um, and to do what monks do, <laughs> um, he approached them. He gave the scenario that these bones were from Ireland and they needed to be reinterred into the ground, and and it needed to be blessed. 
they were so ready to say, yes, Hmm. we want to be a part of that ceremony. So can you imagine the picture in West Virginia? And listen to this. Monks in their habit, in their habit, Mm -hmm. as as it's called, their robe, walking down the road in West Virginia (laughs) in their habits while cars are, are going back and forth, back and forth. They're all in a line with a cross. The archaeologist has got the skull and the bones from the Smithsonian, and it's honorable and it's reverent. Done and in the right way. Done in the right way. Uh, you Native Americans would have been proud. Hmm. I love to hear that. They interred the bones into the ground. And what was amazing, can you believe it? The monks brought soil from Ireland, mm. placed it into the ground and then put the soil of Ireland to honor this person who had given his life again, a peregrine who had involved himself with this thing called the green martyrdom. Mm. Put the, the soil of Ireland mm. on his resting place and began, and they all came together to worship the Lord. You wow, know, what a beautiful way to, to for, for that to come around full circle again. Also, for us to reset what we've thought we've been taught all along. Yes, and you know, I bet, although typically when bones, old bones are dug up, it's a lot of times seen as a negative thing, I guarantee you that those missionaries, I know because I'm from a missionary family, I have lived the missionary life, I know that those monks would have liked for their legacy to be known and carried on in stories, and that they came in an honorable way and did all they could to be um, good carriers of his word and his light. And they buried, they put themselves in a cave knowing that they could be discovered. It's much more difficult to discover somebody who's been buried or burned than it is to be put in a cave where you put writings that you knew you hoped future generations would read. And there's the question also, who buried them? Did the native people there bury them? You know, because that was a common practice to, to do a burial in a cave. Who knows? You know, we, we don't know. I mean, there's so many unanswered questions, but it's unbelievable, but yet true, that there were Irish monks here on this continent who came with the gospel in a good way, you know, and were led absolutely by the Ruach HaKodesh, by the Holy Spirit, by the wind of God that he would send to bring them here. And, and what a beautiful closure to this ancient story to where God even had monks on on the ma- on the monastery there, who happened to have soil from Ireland? Wow! So this goes back to relationship, yes, mm-hmm. between Native Americans and the Irish Celts. Mm. It was based on love. It was based on trust. Mm. It was based on a giving of something eternal to a people. Light and love. Light and love. It was a foundation that was that was eternal. So you can imagine, go forward to the 1700s, when the Irish began to move west again, for other reasons, but they were drawn to the great Appalachian Mountains because... There was established relationship. Mm-hmm. There was it's ba- it was based on relationship, and it, and that relationship, and that that love between the people groups was so powerful that even for example, when was it the Choctaws were being removed during the Trail of Tears? I'll never forget when we were when we were playing concerts at the Highland Games, and one of the the really well known band that was playing the gentleman's also a professor at a university. He was telling me the story of how when they would tour, they would play a certain song that they had written. It has a very Native American flavor to it. And everywhere they played, every pub, every concert hall, 
everybody would stop and stand up and take off their hats. That was and in Ireland, wasn't it? This was in Ireland. And so finally, after this happened three or four times, our friend asked, you know, some of the local folks here, like, you know, every time we do this song, what I, I, at first I thought it was a standing ovation. Then I realized you all were silent, but took off your hats. And the, and the, every Irish person he met told him, we'll never forget what the Choctaw did mm-hmm. when we were starving during the potato famine and they were being removed from their ancestral lands. And even though they were being taken off their lands, the Choctaws sent food and potato to it the was, Irish. It was corn. Corn, corn, sorry, yes, corn. They sent them food. And there's actually a monument somewhere, a statue in Ireland built in mm-hmm. commemoration of the Choctaw people and the gift that was given to the Irish from them to commemorate the fact that even though, and, and the Irish people knew they were going through hardship, but yet they still gifted, they still gave back to these people from Ireland because they knew they were hungry, they knew they were hurting. And they were they had made covenant with, with the people and the first immigrants here. So Daphne... My lifelong friend, will you tell our friends out there how to um, connect with you and what they can do to support your ministry and all that you do? Well, I am a very easy person to get in touch with. My uh, my address is P.O. Uh, per- Peregrini International. There, there's that Peregrini. Peregrini International. P E R E G R I N I International Ministries. P.O. Box 28495 Chattanooga, Tennessee 37424. And uh, my email address, I'd love to hear from you. Any questions that you would have about this, this subject matter or anything else that I can do to um, uh, answer questions? Peregrini, P E R E G R I N I 1, the number 1, at AOL.com. Again, Daphne Swilling. Would love to hear from you. And that's how you can reach me. And we'll put her contact information on the blog that we have about this also. Mm-hmm. Well, Daphne, thank you so much for spending this time with us here as the sun is setting in the beautiful Appalachian Mountains, where there's been an obvious ancient connection between our peoples and father i just ask your blessings on daphne and on her ministry and everything that she does protect her in her comings and her goings lord as as she goes to ireland and back um also just bless everything that that she's working for in the kingdom and bringing these this fire together yes bless her in the governmental mandates that she has and the assignments that she has to bring reconciliation Mm -hmm. concerning the government and the Native American tribes, especially those of us who were removed. And Father, we ask you that you would open the doorways of heaven, the doorways and open the floodgates of heaven, that you would allow your um, forgiveness and reconciliation to occur. We know it's only through your provision of those doorways being open. And so we ask you to give her favor with God and man. And we also we also pray for the people of Ireland. And Father, that you bring a great revival to the Celtic nations, not just Ireland, Scotland, Scotland Isle of Man, Wales, Wales, all the Celtic nations. Galicia. That your holy fire will just spread among the people yes. during these days. And we just bless you and we thank you. And we give you honor, Father. We just love you and bless you. You are the one who brings unity across races.